Good morning, everyone. You know, at first I was super nervous about this TED Talk. Uh, and then I realized that I deal with some of the harshest critics on this planet, 14-year-olds. Um, let me tell you a little bit about what I do. I work at a comprehensive high school. I mean, it's pretty big. It's got 2,200 students. It's about 15 minutes north of here. I have a department of 20 English teachers, and I am one of four males and the only Latino male, so that makes me a bit of a unicorn. Um, additionally, half of my population at my school is Latino, and half of the population can't afford their own lunch. Uh, I've only gotten ninth graders except for maybe a couple classes here and there, and I can assure you they are as awkward as they are charming. Um, and today I want to talk to you about my third year of teaching. My third year of teaching has been pretty fantastic. Uh, leaps and bounds from that first year. First year, you feel like you're building the plane while you're flying it. Third year, you feel like, you know, it's a lot better, I promise. Um, I want to tell you about a specific lesson that I'm really proud of. You see, when I teach my students how to read, uh, and, and I know you might be thinking like letters and vowels. No, I mean really read, really comprehend what they're doing. I start with teaching them how to annotate. I think the problem is when I was in high school, I used to get, you know, a highlighter and I'd go crazy. But if you highlight everything, if everything's important, then nothing's important, right? And so I tell them to use the margins, to talk to the text, to really read. And so this is how we do it. Left-hand side of the margins. You got to make sure that you're asking questions, that you're making connections to your personal life, that maybe other books. This is the stuff that's a little shaky. Right-hand side, that's where you're going to write down definitions, literary features, things you know to be true. And then that bottom section, what happened? What was the summary and, and what went on? So what I want to do now is I kind of want to have an interaction with you. I want to annotate a text that's actually really difficult and that I use with my students. This text is called Hills Like White Elephants, and it's by Ernest Hemingway. This text is exceptionally difficult because it's only two pages. It's a couple arguing in the middle of a, of a cafe in Spain, and you don't know what's going on. The only thing that you know to be true at first is that the woman uh, in question, she's debating whether or not to go see a doctor about something, and, and the gentleman that's with her keeps saying, oh, you should go do it, okay? So before we get started, I want to make sure we know what we're doing here. I'm going to give you the how, how I know what's happening, and your job as, you know, let's pretend to be students, your job is to determine what is going on based off the how that I give you. Make sense? Yeah? Could I, could I get you to clap once if you understand what's happening? Fantastic. Let's do this. Here we go. So... Uh, first hint for Hills Like White Elephants, and by the way, when I do this with my students, I got a document camera, I'm writing notes, and they can see what I'm doing, and they're following along with me, and I'm nerding out about this. I'm jumping up and down. Every hint is driving me crazy, so that in turn, it drives them crazy. And additionally, I don't let them talk to each other about it, because if they spoil that, if they rob someone of their learning moment, then that defeats the purpose of what I like to call the struggle. So, here we go. Try really hard not to tell your peers what's going on. Okay, what is going on between this couple? First hint, my first annotation would be that the title is a simile, Hills Like White Elephants. And my question about that simile, about that comparison is, isn't a white elephant gift exchange when you get rid of a gift that you don't really want? How does that possibly relate here? What are they arguing about? My second hint, at the very beginning, we don't get any names. We just know that one of them is the American and one of them is the girl. Does that mean he's older? Does that mean she's not American? Does this matter? And if so, if they are older, or not from the same country, like how, do, how does that lead us to understand their argument? Third point, characterization. So the girl keeps complaining. She keeps saying, all we do is go out and party and drink. Everything is tasting like licorice. I don't know what's going on. And so I ask, why does everything taste like licorice? What possible thing does she need to go see the doctor about? Is it about her messed up taste buds? And so, at this point, I'm playing whack-a-mole. I'm trying to stop kids from talking to each other, telling each other what's going on, because some of them are catching on. Then there's this hint. The girl's name finally comes up. It means jig, but if you take some time and go to the Google and look up what jig means, it's not just a lively dance. It happens to be when a device is carrying a smaller hole. Now, we're getting close. We're getting warm, right? Last hint, the euphemisms. Every now and then, the guy, he keeps saying, it's a perfectly simple operation. It's perfectly simple. They just let the air in. I think we all know what's happening here. How about you talk to your partners and tell them? What do you think's going on? Go. Don't be scared. Talk to whoever's next to you. Tell them what you think's going on. <laughs> we got more degrees in here than a thermostat. I'm sure you know. 
Fantastic. So, the content, the what in this story, it's about an abortion. And yet, that's not what this lesson's about. I'm not here to moralize or help students decide whether that's right or wrong. I'm here to do something much more complex, and it's the reason that I love this job. I'm here to get kids to be so engaged with the text, even though it's demanding a different load of critical thinking, I'm here to get them to tolerate this ambiguity, as many of us have done in some of the most complicated classes that we've ever taken, right? It's that stick to itness that matters. I'm here to help them make sense of things individually. And that is a transferable skill that is so empowering. It's the very reason why I signed up for this job. And the beautiful part about this lesson, kids were talking about it in their other classes. I told them to go home and think about it. Kids were coming in saying, Billy ruined it for me in dance class. I'm so upset. <laughs> One kid even decided to Snapchat it. He saw me going like this to the text, and he thought I was praying. If kids think that annotations are a religious experience, then I'm doing something right. <laughs> Thank you. I can't stress this enough. I love this job. But sadly, it doesn't love me back. I might read about unrequited love, but I'm not living it. That's something I refuse to do, which is why all I do is think about quitting. I think that in any relationship, the person who cares the most has the least control. I'd like to tell you about the things I don't have any control over. NPR, as I mentioned earlier, did an article about a month ago. They talked about how teachers, their take-home pay, 50 to 70% of it is going towards rent or mortgage. I don't know about you, but that really puts the mort in mortgage. Um, <laughs> no, seriously, it stands for death pledge. Um, I am one of the people who falls pretty close to this, and whenever I bring it up over dinner with colleagues, I get the same advice. Jose, you need to get a roommate. Jose, you need to move back in with your parents. Jose, you just need to wife someone up. <laughs> My problem with all of these pieces of advice is that they either admit defeat or they don't give me the sense of independence that I feel I worked so hard for. So what do I do? I get creative, because I think I'm a pretty solution-oriented guy. And so I teach after school to make a few extra bucks. I teach in the summers, even though other teachers are going on vacation. Right? I look forward to professional development so that I can move me up the salary scale. I work really hard, and in turn, what that does is it distracts and exhausts. It forces me to choose between making a difference and making ends meet. And that I just can't stand for. About pre-recession in California, we were at a ratio, a student to teacher ratio of 24 to 1. Currently, I have 30 students in each one of my classes. That means I have 150 students total. I think this is pretty normal. I don't really complain about it. I just move on with my day, and I, knew that, I know that I need to prioritize. But if you compare it to the rest of the country, it's a 16 to 1 ratio. 16 to 1, that means 80 students. If I had 80 students, do you know how much I could get done? Do you know how much I could grade, give feedback on? How much I can differentiate and help students out with? It'd be fantastic. It's like finding out that there's a Santa Claus, but he just doesn't come to your neighborhood. <laughs> Last thing. Back in 2008, somebody decided to do the math. If you line up every teacher back to back, ask them how long they've been teaching, the mode, the most popular answer, was one year. That's not a revolving door. That is a wood chipper. I've personally seen it myself. This year, five teachers have come and gone in one of my course teams for different reasons, some personal, some more complicated. And what I have found is that this, and this is where the real heart of the matter lies, this isn't about me as much as it is also about the very students who are constantly getting a novice in the classroom, someone who doesn't know the school culture or the curriculum. They're the ones who are suffering, and oftentimes it's in the poorest of neighborhoods. So, just to recap, I want to make sure that we understand one thing. Teachers did not choose a calling. We are professionals, and we deserve to be paid like one. Two. Second, 
Teachers are not to be overwhelmed to the point where they have so many bodies in the classroom that they're constantly playing triage. And third, we are not martyrs. Martyrs stick around long enough to die. Thank you.